There are hundreds of sci-fi movies made all over the world, but the movie that stands out among all is Christopher Nolan's Interstellar. 2014 sci-fi epic Interstellar is based on a dystopian future where the mankind needs to be saved from dying earth. The scientists are finding out ways to save and the plot is majorly focused on the team of astronauts finding a new planet to make it a new home. The film is based on the theory of Dr. Kip Thorne, who is also the executive producer for the film. He has laid two guidelines to make the film. First, that nothing in the film should violate the laws of physics or our knowledge of the universe. Second, that anything speculative in the movie arises from real science. What are the things that make Interstellar so unique as a film? The film is visually rich and real. There are various elements in the making of it which makes it distinctive. From the very start of the film, when the title of the production houses appear, they are colored in sepia tone which represents the arid dry state of the earth with the background score dreaming of crash playing along till we see a bookshelf and a space shuttle shard with dust particles and the title of the film appears here nolan is trying to involve the audience into the movie from the very first second of the film the setting acts as an abstract for the film in the case of interstellar it was going to have to really live or die by those things you're really going to have to look at things in the film and be directly affected by the image not just affected by the characters telling you that something is extraordinary interstellar is inspired from many other films like 2001 space odyssey star wars blade runner etc with the start of the first sequence of the film random old people talk about dust and rot these are real people talking about real event that happened in 1930 these clips were taken from an actual documentary dust ball by ken burns nolan cleverly organizes the movie scenes we were matching to the interview's the narration but sometimes over our nose and mouth so we wouldn't read the so much of it in this video i'll be visually dissecting the film and focusing on its production design complemented by the cinematography and music cinematographer hoita One Hoytama used 35 mm pan vision anamorphic format and IMAX 70 mm. We can see in various sequence of the film the ratio of the screen changes. The cinematographer says the IMAX image is 143 is to 1, so it's more of a square. Because of the size, the experience is more visceral than observational. I feel Nolan uses the ratio 1.43 is to 1 in the film with the purpose of taking the audience into his world and have an immersive experience most of the old epic films use this ratio and maybe nolan wants to bring back that feel into the movies today imax theaters projection screens ratio is bit different too from the standard projections of the cinema it's more wide and is squarish The film was highly promoted to watch in IMAX theaters as it suits the film ratio aptly. Sometimes we see a wide screen in standard ratio 2.40 is to 1 that is probably shot with the pan vision 35 mm. These are generally used for the interior shots or the shots which shows dialogues and interaction between the characters. These type of shots have a shallow depth of field where the focus is on the particular character or object a large part of the film is shot in 35 mm nolan thought if the imax can be used in space to make video why not use it to make a film on space it can be seen in various shot of the movies that the imax was not used as it's conventionally used imax is usually very heavy and requires a set to operate but changes were made and dop hoyta shot with imax handheld and even mounted the camera like a gopro in some scenes we put a lot of effort in trying to get that same kind of feeling that you have when you would mount a gopro so you have to, all the time this very close feeling of your camera's there witnessing something rather than there's a camera somewhere hovering through space like an all seeing eye seeing the situations you you you're really there you're really there in ways that you maybe recognize from real life when you look at footage from the ISS or in the shuttle 
The film uses variety of shots depending on the situation appropriately which helps to connect to the movie on much deeper level. It has some beautiful extreme wide angle shots which is used to establish the vastness of space. For example, look at this shot. It gives a feeling of human existence being very small and the space itself acts as an antagonist in the story and exert dominance over all others. Mostly for dialogues and discussions, mid shots are used. This kind of shots has helped to highlight the perspective of the character while balancing the context of their world through the surroundings. It has emphasized both on the action and the context of the scenes. The frame is a close-up shot when the characters are in tension or show any kind of emotion. This somehow helps the viewer to connect and relate to the situation of the character. For example, where Matthew McCogney is seeing the recording of his daughter, close up of her face is seen in the screen as well as Cooper's close up when he is in tears. The film has been mostly shot in 24 fps, but there are scenes where detailing is required. Like in the scene where spaceships and space station were in wide shot, with a single source of light, that of a sun, which required very long exposure. It was shot with motion control photography in 4 frames per second, and where Dr. Mann explodes the endurance, a small miniature pyrotechnic model was exploded and was shot at 72 frames per second and then rendered into 24 frames per second. The lighting for the film has to be different for most of the scenes, as it's outer space. As director Nolan wanted to keep it simple and real as possible, inspiration from real space footages were taken. As astronauts Chris has filled reviews. I found out after they made Interstellar, some of the folks told me that when I was on the International Space Station and I did a, a cover of a, of a David Bowie tune, and they were trying to decide how to light Matt McConaughey's face when he was looking through the windows of his spaceship, they actually looked at that clip of me to, to see how the light, the actual light on a spaceship looked, and then they, uh, they sort of mirrored that when they were lighting Matt's face. It, it, it made me laugh that art imitating life, uh, imitating art. In outer space, the major source of light is the sun and some lights that are inside the space shuttles and space station. So the lightings were adjusted in the interior of the space shuttle between the buttons and the machines. There were projectors used to give a backdrop of the window instead of green screen. The light was made to pan over the faces in a repetitive manner of the character and on the space shuttles as it created an effect of rotation of the endurance to maintain the gravity through centrifugal force. In the scene where Cooper enters the test track, the major source of the light is window. The room's setup was basically based in space, so the source of light was the sunlight that was directed in the room through the window. There were also 15 projections running through the set to give it a dimensional effect. To make things look real, as real it can be, most of the Nolan films are very rich in its production design. In Interstellar, the combination of cinematography and production design complemented each other, worked very well. Nolan wanted the design to be as genuine and as real as they can be. He advised production designer Nathan Crowley to abandon the idea of futurism, instead keep things as they are and avoid any decorative design. The film was set on actual locations. For the sequences of the earth, the team went to Calgary, Canada. Nolan took inspiration from the painting of Andrew Weste's Christina's World for the tone and the texture of the set. An actual house was planned and built, which had many props around. 500 acres of corn was grown in Canadian rocks. It was on an altitude where the air would destroy the corn fields very easily. This helped the film to portray the people on the earth are facing a large food crisis. Only corn is left and they are desperate to grow it anyhow they can. Later in the film we see dust storm happening. This dust was not a CGI but food feelers which acted like a thick dust. This dust was spread throughout the fans in the scene. Inspiring from NASA shuttles and SpaceX rockets were taken for designing the Endurance and Ranger. 
Endurance had to be spinning to maintain the centrifugal force, so was designed as round. Interior sets for endurance consisting of the three main pods was built on an hydraulic rocker, which would shift 45 degrees up and down. The interiors were very similar to the International Space Station. The design for the spacecraft was made as per the storyline, which says it has been built over 20 years, so it was a mix of old and new technologies. It's also mentioned in the film that they have a very limited amount of funds, so the rocket should have a little raw and dusty looks. Galley units and boxes were used from the airplanes. There were lots of buttons, laptop screens and work machines. The Cairo bed where the characters go for the long sleep were built in a bit modular style. The space shuttles and the space station were built in several model sizes according to the demand of the scene. Like Endurance's 15th scale miniature model was built for shooting it as a whole and 40 feet 5th scale model was built to explode. These big models were carried on the locations and shot but Nolan decided to take these models in a studio, placing it on a hydraulic and shooting it with the space projections in the background where he himself operated the hydraulics. Nolan wanted a robot to be a proper machine rather than having a face of a human. The inspiration was a tripod kind of machine. It was designed in a puppet style operated tin structure which can, which can be operated by humans and vehicle rigs. The final structure were made up of metal which were quite heavy to operate. So the pressure pumps were installed to operate them. The tesseract in the film is Murph's room where Cooper sends her the text messages. It is in a special dimension. To create a proper logical tesseract, it was first mathematically equated and the set was created in a format of four dimensional cubes. The same room was recreated multiple times in a stretched manner which was sent to the special effects team to enhance it into infinite timelines and projections. With this extraordinary alternating open lattice with the rooms embedded as moments in time along the timelines and we gave that to art department and they started constructing from that and there was a lot of back and forth between us uh, exchanging ideas. Cooper was tied by the harness and placed behind the bookshelf and in between the cubicles for the shot. I feel keeping everything so materialistic and tangible helps the actors to feel the things and act naturally. This majorly impacts on their performances which is an upshot for the film. The soundtrack of Interstellar gained critical acclaim and was nominated for Academy Award and original score at the Hollywood Music and Media Awards. Nolan didn't reveal the plot of the film to Hans Zimmer. He just gave a conversation between father and a child and told him to compose a music on it. He later revealed the full plot for the composition. He did this because at the core of the story it was the relation about father and daughter and Nolan wanted to bring it as an essence in the music. Zimmer follows a particular rhythm of question and answer in his film. He composes a question in the notes of the music which builds conflict and tension and then it is resolved with the release of an answer which acts as a resolution to the narrative. It's a question. It's an answer. I mean, it's just how I, you know, I can make the question longer. It's just, I, I, I think there's a, there's a natural way in music where you, where you're basically having a conversation, um, or you want to have a conversation. For example, in this scene, where Cooper is trying to dock the endurance, it's a question whether the Cooper will be able to dock the shuttle or not. We are and we hear this. The endurance is starting to heat. 20 feet out. I need three degrees starboard, Cooper. 10 feet out, Cooper. And the resolution. Zimmer uses the technique of ticking clock very cleverly. 
as the tension of running out of time is supposed to build in the scenes. In this scene where Cooper lands to Miller's planet, where every hour is 7 hours on Earth, we can hear a ticking noise which is 48 beats per minute. But when the pressure builds, as the waves are coming, the ticking noise increases to 60 beats per minute. We need the recorder. The ticking noise was made with hitting pencil against the string of instruments and breathing in and out on vocal instruments and mouth organs. As we see, the BGM is standard and clear when the rocket is launching and is in the upper atmosphere. We can hear the noises of rocket booster clinging of metals due to the pressure. But after the stage 2 separation, the sound is constantly faded and we hear just a single voice of Tars. All feeds going manual. The reason behind this was to keep the BGM as authentic as possible. Sound cannot travel in space due to the lack of medium. This is often replaced with grand instrumental themes. The major instrument used was the church organ. Nolan wanted something representing metaphysical forces and the mankind. For this, they set up a mobile recording in a church. Roger Sayers scored the church organ instrument. Zimmer mentioned in one of his interviews, the church organ was very primal. Something very human was there about the instrument, as it's all air and it breathes. Hans used all this music in raw format and made the best out of it. He recorded every single instrument instead of simulating it. I feel Zimmer brought his own creativity in the music. He studied the film carefully and accordingly, he brought new ideas to amend with the instrumentals and make it more metaphorical. All these elements, well balanced and orchestrated in the umbrella of director Nolan, made the film be real and as authentic as it can be. Interstellar is still considered Nolan's best work and a rare film which is made once in a while.